topic is the event of neuroscience. I will, for the sake of time, uh, I'll do this. Do you remember? I'll do this. I'll fill this in. Remember 1879? Our, our paradigm shifts through the history of psychology that we've been studying all these years, all these weeks together. 1879 in laboratory psychology in Germany or in Europe as a whole was voluntarism with Wundt. Meanwhile, in the US we had William James, which we can roughly call his style pragmatism. Pragmatism. That was, these were the two major paradigms, ways of doing psychology. We then had psychoanalysis outside of the in, uh, what do you call it? university system. That's Freud and his followers. These two had a life that went about that far. Sigmund Freud continues to this day to become a psychoanalyst. Of course, study William James. I keep his two volumes of 1890 Principles of Psychology. They used to be on my desk. Now they're on the shelf just to the left of my desk. My desk was too nice cleared off. But I always, I hope this is useful to you all. I, every time I have something I'm going to write on, whether it's for Psychology Today or for myself or for a book, I always say, what did William James have to say? What did William James say? And I find that every time I read James's thoughts on even what we're talking about today, neuroscience, they're rich, they're relevant, they're insightful, and I'm glad that I looked. And so James, although he, he, he don't do pragmatic psychology today, you will never go wrong reading James. One, he's interesting. Has important things to say. Um, mostly, what I get out of reading Wundt today is that I think he was misunderstood, and I think the differences between he and James were less pronounced than each of them thought. I think they both. James had the luxury of seeing Wundt's later work. Wundt didn't have the luxury of seeing James's because the age difference and they each died. I think that they arrived at a very similar. Psychology, especially the Volker psychology with Wundt and James's left psychology altogether and his own philosophy. We then have Titchener and structuralism at Cornell, and that lasted for a good 20, 30 years until we got to 1913. Behaviorism. Um, and that's built on the uh, on Jesus. James Watson. James Watson. James Watson. John, James. John Watson. What's going on? John B. Watson. You all think you're dumb. <laughs> John B. Watson and B.F. Skinner were the big figures. And that's until the 1960s. And as we said last week, this was predominantly in the US and the UK, and it really set the stage for much of what your parents experienced in the legal system, in the education system, and what you now experience if you want a job, not a high paying job, but if you want to make sure you get a job out of college, study behaviorism. Because if you look on Indeed.com, you're going to see a lot of positions for behavior specialists, behavioral specialists. The people who walk alongside this, the young people with autism and stuff like this and help them to function in society, give them reward and punishment schedules to social skills, all that kind of like behavior, not depth psychology. So it's a, it's a big thing right now with, with this cognitive psychology, the cognitive revolution, which we study last week <clears throat> came about as we found out last week, 56, 57, 58, 59, by the 
time, it was the late 60s, cognitive psychology of dreams. We learned last time that the cognitive revolution was sparked by non-psychologists, by Noam Chomsky, who was a linguist, by George Miller, who was at the Harvard um, Lab for Artificial Intelligence, this is computer science. So we had computer scientists, linguists, gestalt psychologists, remember those cats? The gestaltists were the German group of psychologists who were neither, who were critical of both structuralism and behaviorism. And then we had humanists, existential phenomenolo phenomenologists, we'll just call them humanists so I don't have to write out long words, 1940s, 19, well, really till today, but the prominence, well, in therapy, they're still prominent. So the humanists were a reaction against Freud and against behaviorism. some way you all have an appreciation for the context of what you've been studying in other courses and in other classes within psychology that somehow now you might be aware at least when you're studying with a professor, whether or not that professor is a research professor or a clinical counseling professor. And now you might even realize the differences in what emphasis is placed on what things in those classes, whether it's a therapist or a researcher presenting the ideas. Um, also, understanding where the ideas might fall into a historical perspective. If you have a, cl a clinical faculty member, a professor who's a clinician, and they come from a humanistic background, which is very common for therapists, if they come from this tradition, now you understand why they seem so different from the cognitive professor, the person who's interested in researching perception, et cetera or why they're so different from this behavioral specialist that you might take in a class in. I don't know exactly what class you should take in. Um, and maybe you have a professor, I know there at least one person uh, who's very interested in Freud, Dr. Player is very interested in Freud and used psychodynamic uh, techniques in her um, therapeutic work. So you can see maybe when you're taking classes with you might see a little bit of this influence and see how that contrasts. It's just, a, in my experience, I've had students come to me after teaching this course and say to me, I wish I would have had this course in the first semester. It helped me make everything make sense because otherwise you go through four years of these classes that seem so different. Like in this course, you're studying about this wacky Freud stuff with, that you can't measure and you can't observe the unconscious and dreams, and then you're in another class and they're telling you it's only observable or measurable as you're going to get free in your pharmacology class. It all comes down to reductionism, mechanism, and materialism. You'll remember that from the first part of the class of these things. It just, this course in this history of psychology just helps to put everything else into perspective. So today, here we are. I asked a question in my doctoral dissertation. Postcognitive negation of sadomasochistic dialectic of American psychology. The postcognitive post negation was the question. What's coming next? Post, this is precognitive, this is postcognitive, postcognitive negation. In other words, whatever's coming here is going to be something that negates what came before it, something that's you remember the dialectic of ritual? Synthesis, antithesis, or antithesis, synthesis. So what's the antithesis that's going to exist here? That was the question I was asking. Sadomasochistic dialectic, that's postmodern lingo, philosophical critique lingo for power structures. Why it is that cognitive psychologists and behaviorists look down at humanists because they're fluffy and soft and that are you know, soft, it's soft stuff. And why humanists are critical of behaviors and cognitive psychologists because they're all bones and skeletons and they have no subtlety. They're too stuck on being a, a natural.
actual science. You see, that's the sadomasochism. You probably have all heard sadomasochism referring to sex, sexual sadomasochism. In psychoanalysis, that is a big issue you, you research if you're a psychoanalyst, sexual sadomasochism. This sadomasochism is moral sadomasochism. What is moral sadomasochism? It's power structures. Anytime you've been in a situation where a police officer or a professor or something like this, where you're in a situation of submission, a power structure, that's a, that's a moral sadomasochism. And that's what, how I use the term. So the question remains, what was going to happen next back in 2009? Since that time, the question was pretty much, I think, answered. And that is the event of neuroscience. The event of neuroscience. And that's what we're going to explore today. And I put on the Moodle more than you'll ever want to know about neuroscience and what it's all about. So we have here lecture slides. And I have a few other links that I've posted. Firstly, what I'm going to present to you today is largely comes from this book. And this book, which this is one of the authors of this book, Sally Sattel. This book is called Brainwashed, The Seductive Appeal of Mindless Neuroscience. It was published first. 2013, and it has some updated versions now. Since its publication, I've been assigning it to every class I teach, uh, regardless of the class, because I think it's so important. The book was written by two neuroscientists. Sally Sattel is a re resident scholar in the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy, a research lecturer at Yale School of Medicine, a psychiatrist. The author, she holds an MD from Brown, pretty impressive and completed her residency in psychiatry at Yale. And the other author, author is Scott Lilienfeld, and he's a clinical psychologist and professor of psychology at Emory University. And as you might know, Emory University down in Georgia is one of the most prestigious places you can teach or study. So these two folks are no slouches. But what they wanted to do was write a book that dispelled some of the, that made things clearer for, for people who were interested in this event called neuroscience. The title is interesting, Brainwashed, The Seductive Appeal of Mindless Neuroscience. The key words here are mindless. What does mindless mean? You know from the behaviorists were mindless. Remember they said the psychology had lost its mind. Mind was not discussed during behaviors. Black box was the mind. S stimulus response psychology, SR psychology. Cognitive psychology, if you remember from last week, the critics had said, the historians said, psychology is regaining consciousness. And now we start talking about consciousness, about mind. And that's represented by an O for organism, stimulus organism response. Well, according to these two, and this sparked an incredible light being shed on the event of neuroscience. According to this and critics of today, neuroscience has brought us back to an age of mindless psychology, where we don't talk about mind, but instead we talk about something that appears to be observable and measurable. Notably, namely, computer energy. So that is what this book is all about. Pass this around for you all to take a look at. Know what exists. It's on Audible, so you can listen to it if you want to do that. I would highly recommend that everybody going to take a course in neuroscience or biological based psychology get this book and read it so you know what's going on. So, this is a, an hour long lecture by one of the authors, which is invaluable. So I posted a, I posted a, or the, uh, I posted a file to the first two chapters of this book that you can read. I guess you know how to rotate this. 
somehow and you rotate it, download it, and rotate it so you can <laughs> read it. But you don't want to buy the book. This is the juicy stuff. And I'm going to start by turning you on to that Scientific American, September 25th, 2012. Take a listen to this. I have to say that I am incredibly pleased that this study has won the Ig Nobel. What's the Ig Nobel award? Ig Nobel. And the Ig Nobel is a reward, award is a study that is absolutely ludicrous. Silly, off the wall, but reveals something that is extremely important. It's an Ig Nobel award instead of a Nobel <laughs> award. Ig Nobel. Not just because it's really a fun study, but also because it really is one of those studies that makes you laugh and then makes you think. And in the case of this study in particular, it has changed a lot about how we think about making corrections in fMRI and have actually really affected the way the data is published. And so I present to you the dead salmon study. Bennett et al. Neural Correlations of Interspecies Perspective Taking in the Postmortem Atlantic Salmon, an Argument for Proper Multiple Comparisons Correction, Journal of Serendipitous and Unexpected Results, 2010. That's enough. This study began as a fun trial and almost never saw the light of day, but since it has, it has become a really important study in the field of functional magnetic resonance imaging which measures changes in blood oxygen levels in the brain during tasks, usually humans. I'm going to explain how fMRIs work after we're finished here. These studies are widely used and very, very widely cited in the media, and they have told us a great deal about the brain, our mental abilities, and certain disease states. But until this study, not all of those studies were really adequately Controlled. And now it looks like things are getting better. And all because of dead salmon. You know what salmon are, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yummy fish, and these are dead. It all started when Bennett et al. were setting up their um, real experiment. They were going to look at humans and their responses to social stimuli. But in order to do this, they have to first test the machine. Apparently, when you are usually, when you usually, I'm sorry, when you usually test an fMRI machine, you put a big balloon filled with mineral oil just to test it and look for contrast, etc. The authors of this study wanted something different. They wanted something with more contrast and different types of texture. So they first bought a pumpkin. They got some good signals, but not very good contrast. They next tried a Cornish game hen, dead, defeathered from the supermarket. They also produced good visuals that weren't quite what they needed. The good visuals, but wasn't quite what they needed. The authors needed something with good contrast, but also with several clearly defined distinguishable types of tissue, fat, bone, muscle, etc. Enter salmon. The lead author, Dr. Craig Bennett, wanted to get something fresh, so he headed to the grocery store first thing in the morning. And the fish counter. At the fish counter, he spoke with the words that will echo down the centuries as a testimony to the dedication of the tribe of neuroscientists throughout the ages. I need a full-length Atlantic salmon for science. I am still shocked that these guys in the fish counter didn't give him a discount. Can't you get a discount for science? Having procured this, the specimen, the authors placed the salmon in the fMRI, that's functional magnetic resonance imaging, and ran all the usual anatomical scans. And then they ran an experiment set of the study as well. In this study, the salmon was shown images of people in social situations, either socially inclusive situations or socially exclusive situations. So you get what's happening here. They have dead salmon in, a in an fMRI machine. fMRI shows millisecond by millisecond. 
that's a half a second, 500 millisecond by 500 millisecond, half a second images of oxygen, where, which area of the brain is consuming more oxygen. So they're showing images to dead salmon and looking what the dead salmon's brains register. You see why this is a silly study? The results weren't so silly. <clears throat> Having prepared the salmon, uh, the salmon were asked was at, the salmon was asked to respond, saying how the person in the situation must be feeling. The salmon, as far as I can tell from the paper, did not comply with the instruction. Naughty salmon. The results were set aside and not looked at for a good while until one of the authors of the study running the seminar on how to properly analyze fMRI data. They wanted to do some improper analysis on something improbably, and remember that they had had the salmon data on the computer, and the study was born. Now to clarify, what exactly were they doing? Well, when you do fMRI studies in the brain, there's a ton of information there. The information is generally broken down into sections called voxels. I'll explain what voxels are. There are 130,000 of them in a single study in the contrast selection. Looking at each one of these to see if it is activated compared to others. And during the statistics of the studies get to be a problem. So the studies get to be a problem. You have to do thousands of comparisons and you begin and you mean to and you mean to run into something, you begin to run into something called multiple comparisons problem. You do lots of tests at least some of them will come out positive, and if they are not real, these are called false positives. And if they are, sometimes you really want to watch out for them. To solve this problem, there are various methods for correcting the multiple comparisons. But what also this means is that you lose a lot of statistical power. In other words, you get rid of the false positives, but it might mean that you see things that are really there don't see things that are really there. You might find false negatives instead. There's a running debate in the fMRI field over whether false positives or false negatives are more dangerous. Hopefully from your studies and statistics you'll remember about P-scores and uh, the, the alpha, how you set the alpha power for false negatives and false positives. Don't ask me to explain what Paul just said. It's been 20 years since I studied that stuff. I haven't opened the statistics textbooks in graduate school. I said, no more of this. Uh, there's a running debate in the FMR field. Uh, the authors of this study contend, and I'm inclined to agree, that the false positives are more likely to get overblown and lead to problems down the line. For a really good wrap up of the stats question, I remember the Neuroskeptic's piece on the topic. By the way, for future reference, Neuroskeptic, I included the link, was a blog by Discovery Magazine. That went on for about eight years, and it was uh, uh, an incredibly well written and researched blog that led the the critique against inflated, overstated ideas of what fMRI studies are showing, what those images actually show us. So I'm going to give you the so the final results. And the authors compared the normal multiple comparisons with the uh, multiple corrected comparisons. When they used the multiple corrected comparisons, the dead salmon showed nothing. When they did the multiple comparisons without the correction, the salmon showed significant increase in activation, coincidentally, in the brain and the spinal cord. This shows the importance of the correcting multiple comparisons and avoiding false positives. So what does this mean? What are they? What the, what is this talking about? Here are the images of the salmon's brain. Now you see this is a dead salmon. They asked it questions, and what they got was, although it's light here, you can see brain acid answering the questions. Maybe someone's tempted to say, "Oh, ah, evidence of the soul, <laughs> evidence of life beyond death." What this is evidence of is understood if you understand what this means, what fMRI means, and how activity is measured. 
and why it is that this is a product of mathematics. Now I'm going to back into this to explain to you how fMRI works. The first thing that they had to correct this problem once it was discovered, they changed the statistical methods to correct for this phenomenon occurring that showed false positives. In other words, brain activity that wasn't really there. Unfortunately, it turns out that there were thousands of studies already done that people had relied on in the scientific community in which the results had to be thrown out because this was not yet realized. Now to realize how this is a statistical and mathematical phenomenon, this red light lighting up, you have to understand how an fMRI works. So it, it turns out that uh, today, if you, I know uh, at Rutgers, there, we, we actually have fMRI machines that, we, that you do your, the doctoral students do their research doing this kind of stuff in government research. So most undergraduate students leave having to take a course in knowing how to operate and interpret fMRI scans. Wasn't my interest, but it's interesting. <laughs> it's good to know the mechanics of this stuff. So how does an fMRI work? So it's called functional magnetic resonance imagery. You probably have all seen the big machine you go into. The difference between an fMRI and an MRI is that an MRI shows a structural, it's a structural image, in other words, a still shot. An fMRI shows a half second by half second progression of those still shots. So you're not seeing something in real time. You're, there's always a half second delay at least between whatever is going on in the stimulus and what the brain reading is showing. It turns out it's more like four or five seconds. So there's, a, there's actually a lag that happens. But fMRI is functional, meaning it's showing a functional moving uh, as, uh, image in time, whereas an MRI is structural, meaning it's just one single snapshot. So that's the difference between functional and, and structural, fMRI versus MRI. The thing to remember about MRIs and fMRIs is that they are correlational, not causal. When one sees a, a giving a stimulus or asking someone to speak a certain language or recall a memory or whatever behavioral stimulus you're doing with the subject, and they're giving the on the personal level or the psychological level or the behavioral level, they're having the interaction as a human being and a researcher and what they're discussing. And then you look at the fMRI and you see what is happening in the brain, which areas of the brain are more active. This is not causation. And this is one of the biggest mistakes that people make in interpreting this data. The brain is very tempting and seductive, as the book says, to, to feel like somehow the brain is causing behavior. But we can't make a causal conclusion. This is not cause and effect, it's correlational. What we simply have is something happening on the subjective level. I'll use the word phenomenological because I think it's more accurate, but on the, the level of perception, subjective, what we need to report, I feel sad, I like that, I don't like this, I'm feeling angry, etc. the subjective experience, and the brain imaging result, these are two things that are correlational, not causation. You can't say that the brain is causing the emotion, or that the emotion is causing the brain. They are looking at two aspects of the same phenomenon. So what I would ask you to firstly realize and understand is that brain images are correlation, not causation. Let me see that. So whenever you hear the term, brain, brain images show this area of the brain is responsible for, put on your brakes and realize that someone is writing this that should probably not be writing what you're about to read. That's one of the, as the, as the hardcore neuroscientists, the responsible neuroscientists often say, be careful for the words X is responsible for. More responsibly, you say area X is correlated with behavior Y. Do you feel this difference? So what we're kind of getting here is a, a res, a, an intellectually responsible interpretation of what's going on. That the neuroscientists know 
But as we're going to see, these other ideas of cause and effect are propagated by folks who are popularizers, pop neuroscientists, which we'll talk about. So it's a correlation between an area of the brain that's more or less active and a subjective experience of the person. We look at things called BOLDs. BOLD is the, the acronym for Blood Oxygen Level Dependent Response. The brain has cerebral spinal fluid and blood. The blood that flows through the brain can either be more or less oxygenized. More, it consumes more or less oxygen. It turns out that there are certain aspects of blood that are magnetic. And when you go into an MRI or an fMRI machine, you know you have to take all the metal off, you have trouble, you know, because you get sucked up to the top of the thing if you have an earring. Or a pacemaker can actually be ripped out of the chest. These, wow. So you can't have any metal on you when you go in this machine because it's a magnet. But some aspects of the blood, some areas of the blood are actually have magnetic properties. So when you go into an fMRI, there is a magnetic intense magnetic field going around the brain. And it's showing where that the blood areas are more highly magnetized and where they're not highly magnetized. It turns out that the more oxygenated an area of blood is, the more magnetized they become. So you end up having a baseline, you take a baseline reading, someone goes in and it's an individual has the fMRI, and they take a baseline. So what the brain needs as the, and it turns out that everybody's a bold reading. The, the, the oxygen level reading is different for each individual. So you get the individual's baseline reading without stimulus. You then compare that to the individual's bold reading with a stimulus. And when you do the, this is the magic part, when you do the statistics on this whole thing, this mathematical formula, what you come up with is numerical differences between areas of the brain that show more or less magnetic oxygenized areas. It is then assumed that the areas that are consuming, this is the one of the Gibson neuroscience, that consume, that the areas that are showing more, more oxygen consumption are more active. So far, sounds good. This, everybody's following this? Now, each of these areas of the brain are measured by a voxel. What is a voxel? It's like a pixel. Do you know when you buy a camera, you can get a camera that's high-end pixels or less pixels? The higher pixels you have, the more acuity you have. Well, a voxel is like a pixel. It's a little cubic square area that's very small that the machine uses to measure the bold reading pixel by pixel. So it's like a camera. The more pixels you have, the more accurate the, the reading is of the, of the magnet, magnetization of the brain. Magnetic. Magnetic. magnetic qualities <laughs> of that area of the brain. That's, that's, that's funny. So we have these bold, these little voxels. Now you see this as a, a, a brain. And you, you don't know this because until now, apparently, unless you study this, that each of these voxels is a little square. And when this turns red, from a scale of red, yellow to red. Complete darkness means not dead, but baseline. So when you look at this, these examples up here, you see the p-values. This means not that these areas that are gray are dead. The only time you have absolute gray is if it was actually a dead brain. The brain, the whole brain is always active. What you're seeing here is a contrast between a baseline, anything that's normally just used without stimulus is gray. A 
what you're seeing here is a color assigned to a number. The higher number is red, the lower number is yellow, that you get when you subtract the baseline from the bold reading here in the stimulus presentation. Am I doing this okay? Is everybody following this? It's like you have a baseline reading. You show the stimulus, you ask the person to do the task, and then you see different areas of the brain increase in color on the screen. And these colors are limited to the size of the pixel, what they're called voxels, that measure the blood, the word I can't say, magnetization, I guess, the blood oxygenization in that specific little area of the voxel. Here's the kicker that you might be. So when you see a color, you're seeing something that is mathematically computated and then represented into a color, assigning the mathematical the numerical computation into a color. What you're not seeing is a, a picture of the person. These images you see here on these fMRIs, that is not the brain that's in the MRI, or the fMRI lab. What this is, is a computer program when you're in most of the studies that you're seeing in the newspaper and in the magazine or on the internet, you'll see this brain, and that is a brain model that is part of the computer software. And you're not actually seeing the brain of one person in these studies. You're seeing an average brain of probably hundreds or maybe even a thousand different participants. So the kind of kind of pop idea here is that you're seeing someone's brain, and it's a photograph of the brain that the fMRI gives this movie of the photograph brain, that is not actually what's happening here. What is happening is the brain is the, having magnet, magnet, magnetism around it, areas of that brain that is showing um, contrast activity difference and oxygen, oxygenization, <laughs> oxygenized areas of the brain that are showing differences from a baseline are then fed into this model, and this kind of simulated form of a brain is then reflecting the numerical differences between high, higher and less high activities of brain and no difference from a baseline. Now, now that I've told you this, I, I, I know that it's a little confusing and a lot to take in, but can you get how you can have, if the statistics if the mathematical formula is used to generate the color red and yellow, if, if there's some sort of problem that's not accounting for what we might call feedback, you know if you play electric guitar or if you go up to the microphone and that microphone gets into a certain area that's close to the speaker, you get feedback occurs. That's what I would propose to you as a good, easy way of understanding how color can can how activity can manifest in a dead sample brain. There's not actually activity in the brain, it's a false positive due to the feedback from the mathematical computations. This is just simply an, an introduction for you all to know that it exists, and if you want to really grasp this, you're probably gonna have to go home and watch the lecture that I posted, she's great read the book, they, they describe this, this, or take a class, take a good class in, in reading FMRIs. Now at least you all know responsibly that you're aware of this, even though you might not have a complete understanding, because it is a little difficult to figure out what's going on here. It's a little confusing, first year. The points to take home. FMRI does not give a visual movie of someone's brain. It gives a mathematical, statistical, computer-generated model of the difference between a baseline reading of oxygenization in a brain area and a, and a bold area during stimulus interaction. Any questions or thoughts about this? I put up a slide here. What does an fMRI Show bold response per voxel. 
many different brains average statistically, and you see that image. Correlation, not causation. Remember this? It's very, it's very, pardon me, it's very tempting to say the individual is feeling anger because of the anger area of the brain is active. That's causation. Correlation is the individual is subjectively feeling angry, and this area of the brain is correlated with this. It's called neural correlation, neural correlate. It's more responsible. It's not a picture of the brain. Those are big, big things that you can start off with. Now, the question here is, why is there, why is it that you, I'll be driving home today, and I'll turn on NPR, or a New York Times Science Friday, or I'll pick up a book by some neuroscientist or some person who wrote a pop book. This is your, this is your brain neuromarketing. This is your brain, there's one I'm reading right now, for my media psychology course, which is running it in the fall at Rutgers, uh, this is your brain on porn. What, what porn does to the brain? There's a lot of neuroimaging and um, other biological research about how excessive viewing of porn is reflected, correlated in changes in the brain and also other physical situations in the human body. So this is an example of saying we have to be careful of looking at these as cause and effect and look at more as correlated. There could be a third factor involved in this. For example, in media psychology, there's a lot of research done with neuroscience, neuroimaging, and violence. And they look at children's brains when they are watching violent video games or violent movies, and they see which area of the brain lights up and which is active, and they see is this correlated with violent behavior, etc. And the best we can do is say there's a correlation, not a causation. We don't. We can't say that the video games cause the violent behavior. Turns out that individuals who like violence are more likely to not necessarily cause an effect, but they're more likely to do and participate, enjoy, or be desensitized to violent activities. That we have known for a long time, for 70 years. However, to make the claim that one is causing the other, we cannot do. Because we don't know that what that third factor might be that is influencing both the biological areas of the brain and the behavior. It could be a third factor, like parenting, or anger at society. Or, you know, there's just a lot of factors involved here. So remember, correlation not causation. So who overstates these, these neuroimaging claims? If neuroscientists understand how this stuff works, and they know the limitations of what this, why is there such widespread misconception even amongst educated folks who research this stuff? Well, number one, businesses which sell neuroimaging related services. There are many, many businesses. Neuro entrepreneurs are the term for this. These are individuals that sell, for example, political Political analysis of an individual's brain. You go on the fMRI scan, and they'll have people with PhDs and MDs and researchers who will tell you whether you're liberal or conservative, more Democrat or more Republican or more Green Party, etc. That's a big one. Another big neuro entrepreneur is neuromarketing. Many, many. If you remember a few years ago, I remember this when the potato chip aisle. New ladies started doing organic potato chips. They were healthy potato chips, baked and all this stuff. And one of the big differences, if you walk down the aisle today, you'll see this. They put the healthy potato chip bags in a matted, not shiny, non glossy packaging. The original, greasy, deep fried, yummy ones, those are in glossy bags. Well, they found out through neuroimaging research that people kind of subjectively interpret matte, you know, non-glossy or matte things, like organic colors and like a flat bag using more earth tones. They take this as a visual metaphor for health or organic or good for you. Whereas glossy, shiny colored bags, this is not healthy. 
right next. Now, some of you might be saying, I don't need to look at the neural images to know that. That just makes sense. That is what's called neural redundancy. And it's a term I'm going to point out to you again. The term neural redundancy is when neuroscience sets up a study using neurological imaging, neural imaging, fMRI imaging, to show something that we've already known for many years. So it turns out that marketers have known for a long time that if you use earth tones and matte colored packaging, a more basic, simple presentation that people feel that's more healthy than glossy, shiny packaging. But nevertheless, this is one of the big findings of neural marketing. Neural marketing is a really big field. Millions of dollars. Lay's potato chips spent millions of dollars having neuro imaging of individuals who are asked to look at a bag of potato chips and ask if they feel this is healthy or not healthy and changing the design of the bag while they're in an fMRI machine. Amazing. Millions of dollars. One of the big books is called Biology. Biology, if you want to look into that. Number two. University public relations offices who seek notoriety for their institutions. A lot of the overstated claims about neuroscience findings, FMRI findings, come from, comes from not only businesses who are looking to look at a profit, but universities who are looking to attract students to come to the schools. Now, universities are largely called non you should probably understand from the get-go that this does not mean that everybody's doing it for free. <laughs> Your professors are getting paid, the college president's getting paid, and the football coach is making even more. Millions compared to a few thousand dollars. So at any rate, that being said, that's my political statement for academics. That being said, universities are not for profit, but that doesn't mean that they don't Profit. They take it means that the money that they get gets reimbursed, re reinvested back into the university system. But everybody is still making money. You're still getting paid to teach or to be the administrator or to coach the football team. So university public relations offices will take a study that was done at their university and not do the boring thing like, well, this shows correlation, not causation. Not state something in kind of a, an unglossy, understated way about like a scientist would, but they state things in a way that will attract more students to their school or give their school more prestige. Look what we have. Again, the, the PR offices of universities are some of the biggest offenders for overstating what the research says that's coming out of their universities. That's big research universities, you know. So, Third, researchers who are motivated to publish or perish their careers. In a research institution, this isn't true at a, a cozy school, a nice little liberal arts school like we're at here, but a big research institution, the professors that are teaching, they'll probably be teaching one class a year, and the rest of their time is devoted to running the research lab, to getting million dollar grants for the research lab, and then they're required to teach one class a year. And then you have teaching faculty. If I, I don't run a research lab, I teach as teaching faculty. I teach courses. And stuff. I like teaching. So these other individuals are doing, they're caught in this thing called publish or perish for their career. If they want tenure, if they want to keep their jobs, if they want to stay on top of their career path to becoming dean or chair of the department, whatever it is they're after, they have to publish, publish, publish. Now, Publish or perish means if you aren't publishing articles and getting grant money coming in and into your school, then you're going to perish. You're going to lose your position. Now, can you see how this would be a pressure that might cause some scientists in any ball of profession, but any academic discipline, to maybe at times overstate or fake good just to get their work published? It's part of the academic publishing game. So this is another, maybe not as large as the others, but it's another big factor in university research. Science journalists who learn how to write well, but do not learn scientific knowledge to discuss the science issues with nuance or accuracy. About nine years ago, I got the 
feeling that I wanted to study journalism, in particular science journalism. And the reason I wanted to do this was because I saw such horrible science writing taking place. Famous newspapers, famous newspapers and news agencies and magazines and websites were publishing science writing that was highly misleading, highly inaccurate, mostly about psychology. So I thought, well, where's the best journalism school in the country? Columbia University School of Journalism. So I applied. And my application was a essay, <laughs> big essay, uh, on this, on how science journalism produce the science journalists are great at writing well and presenting their ideas with excitement and pizzazz and flavor, but what they're saying is not responsible. They're reading something and making it attractive, but not scientifically accurate. So they're speaking about things that they don't have enough knowledge or nuance to truly understand. I got in. I didn't go. It was too expensive. I said to myself, I'm only going to go if I, get a, if I get a scholarship. I didn't get a scholarship, but I was accepted. I'm actually very proud of that. And I think I had a very, I think I had a very good reason for wanting to go to understand this. At any rate, so science journalists. Some of them are great. Be careful of their value. This is one of the big things for references and why it is your professors always say, be careful what you use as a reference in your research projects and presentations and papers. Just because it's in the New York Times or NPR or Newsweek doesn't mean that it's actually good. It could be junk. And you're learning now how to discern when you see the words. Area X shows, brain scans show. Be very careful because there's very few things that you can show a direct relationship in human psychology about. Very basic things you speech, production, listening, stuff like that. But when it comes down to big, kind of nuanced aspects of the human psyche, emotion, motivation, personality, or um, political affiliation, or what else is there? Uh, morality, ethics, that stuff. The computer, at this point, computers cannot, imaging cannot show anything they can tell. It's all guesswork. And finally, pop neuroscience books for the general public. You have to always look at the back of the book and see what the person's, the author's credentials are. Were they an English major? Great. That means you probably have a good book. But what do they really know about science or how science is done? Any questions or thoughts about the overstated? What time is it? Oh, a few more minutes. So here's some lingo. Some lingo you should know. Blobology. Blobology is a word that neuroscientists use to describe research that says area X is responsible for behavior Y. Blobology, a disparage. So when you hear blobology, it's not a compliment. Blobology is a disparaging term used by neuroscientists for studies that show brain areas become active when subject X experiences or perform task Y. Um, uh, Neurohype, neurohubris, neuromania. This is a term used to describe overstated abilities for neuroscience. So if you get a book and it's making claims that if you want to sell this, you have to do this because a neuroimage showed this amygdala lit up when they saw this, that's neurohype. That's over, with a term for overstating the findings. Is, it's hype. It's publicity. You know, it's neural redundancy, as I explained that one earlier, this is when a, something that has already been known in psychology, such as the area of the brain that processes vision or hearing, is shown once again, but now using the newer technology. That's nice, but it's neural redundant. It's, in other words, showing something that we already knew. Reverse inference, very important thing to remember. Reverse inference is one of the great sins of pop neuroscience. It's a common practice wherein researchers reason backwards from neural activation to subjective experience. One-to-one -one mapping is not accurate because one area has multiple activities. So the individual is shown an image of Donald Trump 
populist. Follow Donald Trump, and this person happens to be anti-Trump, and of course their brain image lights up that shows disgust and anger and hatred. Therefore, we know they like a lie detector, and there is, there are businesses not submissible in court, admissible in court, sorry, not admissible in court, but they do submit individuals to research, claiming that they can see if you can if you're lying or not. You know who their biggest um, customers are, their biggest clients? Uh, cheating spouses, people who are trying to find out if their spouse is cheating. But this is not admissible in court to this, to this point yet, because it's too complicated. You can't say this. Why? Because it turns out that an area of the brain that shows disgust or hatred is also active for things like novel stimulus, things that are new, or things that are unusual. And one area of the brain doesn't, and when it comes to psychological phenomenon, a complicated psychological phenomenon like love and hate and dislike and like, etc., it's not as easy as this reverse inference suggests. So be aware of studies that are using reverse inference. Uh, and finally, neurorealism. Neurorealism is taken from the term that we discussed in this class called naive realism. Naive realism is the idea that biological psychologists talk that reality is reality in itself and has, remember, the passive model of the mind, pre-Kantian, that the mind kind of passively registers the stimulus of reality, and we got into Kant and idealism. We said the mind, some of you really research this for your projects, so that the mind is participating in reality. Well, neurorealism is the idea that the brain causes the experience, that the brain somehow is the reality, that neuroactivity is showing that this is real. And that's called neurorealism. OK, you can look at these. I probably said them all. We got to stop because we're at the end of the course. And I want to tell you, I really had a good time. I, I sincerely enjoyed spending time with all of you, and um, I hope that it was rewarding. I hope that it was worth your time. And I hope you take something from this seminar that enriches you in your future studies, and enjoy your summer. Thank you very much. Any questions about uh, our final thing here, neuroscience or about the history of psychology? Always welcome to, if you have something in the future and you say, I wonder what history of psychology thinks about this. Send me an email. And I'll tell you, I don't know, <laughs> but I'll direct you where to look. And if I do know, I'll be happy to tell you. But I don't know that much, so. <laughs> but I know where to look. That's a good, that's a good start. All right, everyone. Enjoy your rest of your time, and I see you next time. <laughs>